Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This time, Josh Hart of Feather River Action in Plumas County, joined me to speak about the U.S. Forest Service's plans for an emergency thinning of forests in this northeast part of so-called California, a plan which is uh, threatening to be reproduced in other federal and private lands in the name of fire prevention around the country. We talk about the claims of the federal government, motivations of biofuel producers and logging companies, and alternative proposals of activists, scientists, and community members, as well as the upcoming Lost Sierra Forest Climate Action Camp happening in the area at the end of May, May 23rd through 29th. Anyway, as always, thanks again so much for the support, and I hope you take care. Thanks for having me on. Um, My name is Josh Hart, H-A-R-T, he, him my pronouns. And I'm the spokesperson for Feather River Action. Our website is featherriveraction.org. We uh, defend the vital Feather River watershed and build community. Um, That's our goal. We're based in Plumas County, California, between Tahoe and Lassen in northeastern California. Uh, And we were formed in 2021, which is the same year that the Dixie Fire burned almost half the county here. We oppose a series of industrial threats to to wild areas, including two asphalt plant proposals over the past three years, right by the river, the, the, the headwaters of the Feather River. And we've opposed one aggregate mine near the headwaters. You know, there's an increasing industrial and extraction threat to rural areas, uh, which are increasingly being treated as sacrifice zones. And um, we're trying to raise awareness and build uh, resistance to these plans. Cool. Thank you very much for being willing to talk and and talk about this important work that y'all are engaged in. Would you tell us a bit about this, this like area that you're in? Some of the areas that I've heard named in in documents on your website are like Lost Sierra or... I know that the Plumas National Forest is right around there. And could you talk a little bit about, yeah, I guess just start off, I'll just cut that question in half. If you could talk a little bit about uh, some of the ecology there, some of the animals and plants, Mm -hmm. and, and also, I guess, like the industries that exist there. Yeah. So um, Plumas County uh, sort of more or less overlaps with the Plumas National Forest and uh, the Lost Sierra refers to the Feather River watershed. And this is the area between Lake Tahoe um, in the south and Lassen in the north. It kind of encompasses a a very large area. Um, It's called Lost Sierra because um, it hasn't been as heavily impacted by tourism or development, some other places in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. So that means there's less population. There's, for example, um, only 18,000 population in a county the size of Delaware. So it's a vast area with um, very small communities and a very low population. This has allowed the wild to recuperate from the decades of damage um, inflicted on it. And so now uh, we have uh, ancient forest, which is recovering. We have two wolf packs uh, in Plumas County who have come probably down from Oregon uh, to expand into new territory. Um, people t- have taken photographs of um, entire prides of mountain lions. I mean, when have you heard of a pride of mountain lions? Something you hear about in Africa. And so even though this is not like an intact ecosystem, like we would talk about in some parts of Alaska that are completely untouched, um, it is a lot of it is mostly intact. And we have some really uh, essential carbon storage in the form of mature and old growth forests. And and these ancient forests that are just um, irreplaceable. Um, some of the, you know, one of the only rainforests in the Sierra Nevada mountain range is found in Strawberry Valley. Unfortunately, one of the areas they want to, to log. But uh, there are many, many endangered and threatened and sensitive species uh, of plants and animals in our area. Um, you know, it, I, I, I uh, grew up in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. And I mean, when I moved to Plumas County, I was astounded to see river otters and the river beavers making dams. Um, just something you don't see uh, a lot in, in more urbanized areas. And, you know, um, we need to protect that wild and allow it to recover further, um, to rewild it, not bring in all these extractive industries. And the large predators often 
mean that there's like a series uh, to my understanding means that there's like um, a pretty healthy ecosystem and complex ecosystem that they're a part of um, that can sustain their immediate food sources and those food sources that they feed on and so on and so forth. Right. So that, um, as you said, even if it's not like intact as in like untouched by humans and there have been people living in like that mm-hmm. area of California anyway, since time immemorial, but, but that, that says a lot about like, about, yeah, the communities yeah. of animals and plants and how they interact, right? Yeah, predators are essential for a healthy ecology. They are absolutely part of the ecological cycle. Um, and the fact that we do have wolf packs uh, coming to, coming back to Plumas after, you know, 100 years of not being here. And um, we do have uh, prides of mountain lions and all of these animals, um, uh, foxes and, and um um, bobcats and, and so forth shows that there is a healthy ecology and and just so um, your listeners are aware the, the feather river is the largest watershed in california it's responsible for providing water to 26 million californians as well as a lot of agriculture um, through lake oroville so this is a it's, it's a really essential water source for the whole um, of california it's really essential wildlife habitat it's been touched less than other places in california uh, and the, the way that the Feather River got its name was that um, when settled, when um, European settlers first came to this area, um, what they witnessed was a moving conveyor belt of feathers. They couldn't even see the river itself, the water of the river, because there were so many birds that lived in this area. Their uh, feathers literally coated the entire surface of the water. And so... Um, our goal as an organization, as Feather River Action, is to get back to to approaching that point to to say, you know, uh, this is a an area that is already wild that we can go further with, um, and that we can, um, you know, build back those populations of um, animals and plants so that there really is a healthy, thriving wild ecosystem, and that's also going to benefit local economies too. Can you talk a little bit about those human econ- or human economies and like what what sort of industries the populace of of your area are engaging in and sort of how that relates to the natural environment there? So, um, you know, Plumas County is a logging community. Um, you go into Quincy, which is the um, county seat of Plumas County, and maybe about two thirds of the businesses will have, you know, we support the timber industry placards up. So it's it's a very much a pro timber industry community. Uh, There are people here who are not pro timber industry and who are here because of the wilds. And, you know, there's a bunch of people in between too. The economy is, you know, it's a a rural community. So very low density. Um, You have people working for government agencies. Uh, You have people working for the the small local hospitals, people working from home increasingly. But, you know, we've been impacted by the Dixie fire, which burned half of Plumas County, including the, the town of Greenville, uh, three years ago. And so people who, you know, lost their homes um, ha- are having to rebuild. And the, the the community, I mean, Plumas County is a very unique place. It's, it's a place that's relatively affordable still and relatively wild. And um, it's in California. And th- those things are, are really increasingly rare. And so we have a lot of people coming in from Tahoe and elsewhere, the Bay Area, buying up Um, property. And um, in Portola, uh, which is the only incorporated city in in Plumas County, you know, a lot of these uh, small kind of fire prone houses are being redone and and rented out um, because, you know, the the lack of available and affordable housing in the Truckee and Tahoe area is kind of gradually heading north to, you know, so people are, are working in Truckee, working in Tahoe, and then living in our area and commuting. So that's not great from a climate perspective, but it, it, it is, you know, kind of a, a, a knock-on impact from the tech industry effect on rents and housing prices in the Bay Area. That's kind of, you know, spread outward from the Bay Area. And so we've talked. You've mentioned a couple of the the large fires that happened in the last decade that severely impacted your area, but obviously these were big enough to to spread and have impacts throughout the rest of the state. Whether it be flames like actually working their way to towards the coast, or terrible air quality, or pollution in the water supplies. But I, I wonder if you could talk a little about the, like one of the reasons that we were here to talk is because of. Feather River Action and other groups' response to the, I guess, the U.S. Forest Service plans for um, for cutting parts of the forest. 
Um, mm. Could you? So that's the community protection plan. Is that right? Or is that is that the same as the Central and West Slope project? Or is that like a sub part of the? Yeah. CPP? So um, we're calling this project that the U.S. Forest Service wants to carry out in our area. We're calling it the Community Destruction Project. Um, they're calling it the Community Protection Project. And uh, this is this is basically the some of the most aggressive logging that's ever taken place. Um, they are using the fear of wildfire, people's very justified fear of wildfire, to justify this extreme logging when it will not achieve the goals that they set out for the project. Um, it's a $650 million program. So like the good part of a billion dollars heading straight for one small rural county, Northern California. It's 275,000 acres altogether. The central and west slope portion of this is one portion. There's also an east side portion closer to Susanville. But together, I mean, we're talking about over 400 square miles of industrial deforestation, herbicide application. And um, in their documents, they admit to carrying out up to 77% canopy reduction, uh, which is essentially a clear cut, you know, leaving 23% of the, the canopy um, untouched. And they're, they're targeting trees, which are up to eight feet uh, in circumference. So that these are, these are large, mature, fire-resistant trees that they're logging in the name of um, fire resistance. So uh, they are using propaganda and fear to push forward a, an aggressive timber um, harvest uh, uh, agenda that not only targets California, but also several of the other Western states like Idaho, um, Montana are also targeted. The forest down in, in the Big Sur area, uh, Ventana, uh, that area, that's that's also targeted with a, a similar scale of forest treatment, which um, you know, refers to uh, intensive logging. So essentially what the Biden administration is doing, they announced several months ago, you might have seen this, that we're going to phase out logging in uh, old growth and mature forests. And we're going to you know protect these forests as carbon storage. And uh, you know, it sounded really, really good. But with, their, with the other hand of the Biden administration, with the head of the U.S. Forest Service, Service Agriculture Department, Tom Vilsack, um, he's basically authorized this emergency declaration to authorize extreme logging in many of these old growth and mature areas that the Biden administration is claiming to protect, but only in, in the, I think it's 2025 when these regulations come into effect. And so they're, they're planning to basically, from my perspective, looking at the situation, cut the old growth and mature forests while the regulations still allow it, while saying that they're protecting it, but their, their protections only go into effect once these forests have been um, have been cut, basically. So it's not an honest thing, um, and we are, you know, uh, uh, pretty outraged at that. So much money, uh, that nearly a billion dollars, is going to fund forest destruction that will make wildfires more extreme, while ignoring the very real needs of people in, in, in local communities to have immediate financial assistance with home hardening and with uh, creation of defensible space, which are the only things that science um, identifies as being associated with uh, structure survival during a wildfire. So, you know, structure, structure defense, uh, defensible space, and a, a, a fire um, con, you know, containment personnel within that space. If you log out in the forest miles away from communities, there is strong evidence that these kind of uh, treatment um, management activities actually speed up fires. Um, so that the winds that that blow wildfires, that, ex that, that, that grow wildfires, are able to blow faster through thin forests um, because no natural forests act as a windbreak. Forests have evolved to... Uh, to keep, especially in the eastern part of the, the state, which is drier, uh, forests have evolved to um, trap moisture, to keep moisture available to the plants and to the trees that use it. Um, and by thinning, you allow wind and sun to penetrate the canopy and uh, a massive drying out. So, I mean, my wife and I, we live in what's called the um, wildland urban interface, the WUI, and we're really alarmed by what the Forest Service is planning, because what it means is that when a, when a wildfire comes and the wildfires are inevitable, you know, they're going to come, the, the wildfire will travel faster through a thin forest than it would have through the forest as it stands now. It's wild. And that means, uh, you know, direct impacts to us, such as reduced time to evacuate our animals, our family, to pack everything into cars and to, to get out of there if we need to. And so, there's a lot of manipulation of, of, uh, of fear and of public understanding of these issues, and we're trying to kind of set the record straight. 
Can you talk a bit about some of the sourcing for your documents, like just just uh, some of the scientific papers that have been published and some of the people that make a living studying this stuff that you refer to? So um, a really great source of scientific information that really um, shifted my understanding of this whole issue is a book called Smoke Screen by Chad Hansen, H-A-N-S-O-N. We uh, have been distributing that book in Plumas County. Uh, Chad Hansen is a, an expert in, in wildfire uh, policy and, and forest management. Um, and he runs the John Muir Project, who is one of the plaintiffs, one of the three plaintiffs, including um, ourselves uh, and Plumas Forest Project, who are actually taking the U.S. Forest Service to court um, to require an environmental impact statement on this project. I can put a link in the show notes for that if folks are interested in getting a copy. So having moved to the East Coast from the West Coast and seeing conversations and, and seeing the impacts of climate change on forest fire patterns, a couple of years ago, Eastern Tennessee suffered some, and parts of Western North Carolina suffered some pretty heavy fires. This is about 2017, I want to say. It kind of like drove home to me. I had the assumptions of like, yeah, forests are, or fires are a part of the life cycle of forests, having grown up on the West Coast and understanding that certain trees don't don't proliferate unless there's a fire to make space and also the heat to like open up the seeds and, and such. But um, that's not the case. <laughs> we shouldn't be having fires on the same scale here. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about a, just for folks that may not be aware, when you mention trees being... The, um, protected from fire, like pretty fire resistance, and also a little bit about how fire plays a part in the ecosystem in some of the forests in California. That could be useful for um, listeners who maybe aren't as familiar. Yeah. So um, the, the, the trees that they're targeting are actually eight feet around, so eight feet in circumference, they're, they're, which is basically 30 inch width at breast height uh, maximum, just to be clear on that. And uh, yeah, in general, fires are healthy for ecosystems. Um, ecosystems and ecologies uh, ad uh, adapted, they evolved to um, be able to survive fire. And fire acts as a rejuvenating agent um, to these fires. It often burns uh, litter on the forest floor. It provides nutrients to new saplings. And so you go back after a fire, even a very intense fire goes through, and there's all this life coming back up, you know, um, just just rearing to go and, uh, uh, you know, threatened species such as the California spotted owl and the black backed woodpecker actually depend on intensely burned areas for, for their feeding area, because uh, little, little rodents love that kind of, um, that kind of area where it's burned. So, um, a lot of the time you'll, you'll see the U S forest service and the logging industry bemoaning how oh the, the these wildfires are destroying our our forests and that's just not true what's destroying our forests are post fire logging where they come in after a fire and cut down trees that are either dead or dying or perfectly healthy and alive and we see those trees being hauled out um, like a conveyor belt truck after truck um, heading down highway 70 in quincy so those are being pulled out and that's um, what has you know the, the lack of dense forest of dense mature and, and healthy forest uh, is, is associated with declines in the spotted owl population. Just as they're doing that, the U.S. Forest Service is taking 80,000 acres of formerly protected ha nesting habitat and foraging habitat and opening it up to industrial and mechanical logging. Just without explanation and unilaterally, they have not held a single public meeting. And I think people need to realize, and this is something that I didn't realize when I moved to this area, is that, you know, we kind of knew that there was going to be logging behind us at some time. You know, we got, we've, we've grown really attached to the forest behind us. It's um, incredibly beautiful. There's aspens and streams and springs. And it's, you know, it's really um, a beautiful, uh, uh, unique uh, woodland behind us. Um, and we always assumed there was going to be logging. But what we didn't realize was that was that the U.S. Forest Service and the U.S. government and these forces, the timber industry that are pushing these projects forward, they really detest the wild. They, they hate the wild. Um, what they want to do is not just come in and cut and take. They want to convert this wild land with a diverse shrubs and some, some shrubs that live uh, hundreds of years um, and provide food and uh, shelter for, for many species. They want to clear everything 
and using herbicides uh, continually treat the the native shrubs that are coming back um, so that only the the crop, only the timber is going to grow back. And so right now, you know, you, you can walk out your house uh, many places in Plumas County and go back into wild forest that's uh, where trees are uh, several hundred years old, where the forest really hasn't been touched since large scale logging early in the 20th century. And if this project goes forward, you know, people will be walking through a poisoned landscape damaged landscape around communities full of slash piles, which burn readily, and full of small trees, which also burn readily. So um, we didn't quite grasp the fact that there were plans to basically, like they, they look at the wild and they say, oh, this is wasted space. You know, this is not productive for our economy. This is not productive for capitalism. How can we make this productive? And Animals and plants don't have rights. I mean, the, the ones that are that are the most impacted by humans, that are the most on the edge, have legal rights under our under the NEPA system um, and under a California Environmental Quality Act. But um, all the other ones are not even mentioned. You know, the fact that bulldozers can come in, masticators can come in and just basically murder native animals and native ecologies is just it, taken for granted. So, um, you know, people, I don't think, I think some people in Plumas County uh, and beyond are of the notion of, oh, these wildfires are just insane. We've got to do something. We've got to go into the forest. We've got to create a buffer. And, you know, it's it's a very reactive approach. If we look very carefully at the science, the science is telling us that the, the these massive uh, this massive increase in wildfire activity in California is related to climate change. It's related to human caused um, gases in the atmosphere that's making higher winds and higher temperatures more likely. And those are the factors which um, can lead to large wildfires. So instead of attacking the climate crisis, they, okay, we've got to slash emissions. We've got to like you know uh, figure out how to absorb. Uh, this carbon from the atmosphere, uh, you know, they are instead embarking on this dangerous uh, cycle, this this basically self-fulfilling cycle where they're reacting to wildfire by cutting forests, which are huge sponges for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And, what, and we need them to remain intact in order to absorb that carbon. Uh, but they're cutting them and as a result, you know, you have once you cut a tree, it starts to off gas that carbon into the atmosphere right away. And people think, oh, well, logging, it goes into furniture and houses and the carbon just stays there. Only between about 15 to 18 percent, according to studies of the carbon in wood that's, that's harvested in a forest is actually stored in the final product. Uh, the vast, vast majority is into the atmosphere and and, and worsens, you know, the, the kind of um, preconditions that lead to the severe wildfires. So we need to embark on an emergency effort to harden homes, to provide grants uh, to harden homes if you, if you can't afford it, if you're not wealthy. And we need to provide uh, grants for uh, hand thinning and underburning in the immediate area around communities. So that means 100 to 200 feet. That's what the science shows is really critical in terms of reducing um, uh, structure uh, structures burning in a wildfire. But the fact that we, you know, there, there's a little bit of ignorance. There's one part ignorance and there's one part arrogance. You know, um, the ignorance part is that it's all about fuels. It's not all about fuels. And anyone who tries to build a fire in a wood stove will know that it's not just about fuels. It's about how um, moist they are and how much oxygen is allowed to access that. And so if you transfer that to a forest, you know, yes, we need to reduce uh, fuels right by your house, you know, right around your house that would would um, feed, would feed the fire, the, the, the flames. Um, but uh, uh, going out into the forest to try and engineer forests to be so that fire personnel can come in and try and control these huge fires. I mean, it's just like you need when these things come through, you just need to get out of the way. I mean, I was driving to Reno uh, during one of the the fires uh, a couple of years ago, and there was a, what's called a fire nato, just one of these like you know where, where the fire creates uh, currents where a the firestorm. Flame. A firestorm, yeah. And you saw these flames going up in a in a corkscrew, like hundreds and hundreds of feet up into the atmosphere. And I just got chills all over my body because suddenly all the stuff, all the statistics about the climate crisis and everything just became very real. You know, this is our backyard. Um, this, these are forces of nature that we've unleashed that are are, are really, really intense and, and are, are not, you know, they can be dangerous. And so the fact that we have a government who's, who's using pseudoscience 
and pushing forward logging as a as a, a solution to these wildfires when it's actually going to exacerbate the climate crisis, which caused the the wildfire crisis. It's really disturbing because you don't you know you suddenly realize oh well you know. <laughs> This is a captured agency, the U.S. Forest Service. This is not a neutral agency that serves the public, that manages public land. The reality is that the U.S. Forest Service is corrupt. Um, it is, uh, you know, uh, compromised by the um, the industry, the timber industry that it pretends to regulate, and that it needs to be replaced by another agency um, who, it, or, you know, is going to treat public lands um, as sacred and as a, a crucial source of carbon. Um, right now, the Forest Service is is not doing that, and they are embarking on a very dangerous uh, path um, with a lot of uh, opposition in the in the local area. There was a couple of other points um, around the forest. Like, I, I think it's really important to note the, the. I was trying not to to distract myself with that that phrase, like seeing forest for the trees or whatever. Like, <laughs> pe- when people are when we're when we're talking about this, it can be very easy to just focus on the big boys in the tree in the forest or the big girls, like the 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 trees themselves. But it's not that's not the ecosystem itself. And as you mentioned, like the Feather River is a very important watershed for a lot of the rest of the state, let alone the local population there. Um, so two things water related. I wonder if you could talk about real quick about um, thinning of trees, um, the destruction or s- salvaging or whatever they want to call it of brush and fallen trees and other things and how that relates to erosion. And the other thing is like, a little bit more about all of those herbicides that you were talking about them applying and what that could mean for down the stream folks in the Bay folks in the right, central right. valley. Yeah. So you're right. I mean, the forest uh, typically, you know, uh, especially, you know, uh, federal agencies, state agencies and uh, foresters will look at the forest and go, Oh, it's a, it's a bunch of trees. It's a marketable timber. You know, we're going to take it out. Obviously uh, if, you, if you ask an ecologist um, or if someone who's very familiar with all the residents of the forest, I mean, there are uh, microorganisms in the soil that we're just discovering now, um, and we don't understand, the, uh, you know, all of the the details of how this ecosystem works. Um, what we have, what science has discovered over the uh, over, over recent years, is that uh, trees and shrubs communicate um, through mycelium. Uh, they send each other messages. If there is a struggling tree or shrub, the other trees and shrubs will pitch in and send that that tree or shrub resources so that it can survive. And then that favor is paid back. So we have, um, you know, trees are not these objects. They are aware beings um, that form communities and that support each other when times are hard. And this is just, this uh, this kind of uh, evidence is ignored and dismissed by the Forest Service who use a competitive model. They basically say, oh, well, trees compete with each other for resources and they take water from the ground and they're just basically products. <laughs> and this is just inconsistent with the science and what we know. And the project, uh, according to the U.S. Forest Service, the project will emit more than 6 million tons of CO2 when we should be absorbing, allowing forests to increase their absorption. In terms of the herbicides that they plan to use, uh, they plan to use seven different herbicides, including glyphosate, which is known to cause cancer um, and known to to run off into water bodies. Um, And they're also using a uh, herbicide called emazapir, uh, which is uh, illegal in the EU due to its high toxicity. Um, so according to one um, scientific assessment, um, the comments by Dr. O'Brien to the, uh, to the project, um, this is basically the constitutes the largest single experiment on the people of Plumas County that's ever been um, carried out because not only, you know, and I asked the Forest Service, well, how much actual herbicide is going to be distributed across the landscape? Uh, they, they, they told me $30 million is the budget for to pay the people who apply the herbicide, uh, but they wouldn't give me a, a, a total of the amount the actual cost of the herbicide. And I said, well, $30 million, if you go to the Walmart website and you type in, you know, Roundup and see how many gallons you can get. And we're talking like 
several Olympic sized swimming pools full of glyphosate. And they wouldn't tell me, I said, well, this is what I'm estimating. You know, they, they, they just don't provide that information. And it's like, that's really important information to know because these are, these are long lasting uh, toxins. They will flow into the feather river. There's no doubt about that. Um, and uh, they're being used in a way that uh, undermines the, the basic ecology and the carbon storage of our area. So, you know, when you talk about a major logging project or thinning or whatever they're going to, whatever they want to call it, you're talking about huge levels, uh, four to square miles. You're talking about soil compaction from the vehicles that are going to be going in here from the masticators, from the feller bunchers. So you're talking about soil compaction, which inhibits soil's ability to absorb carbon and starts, you know, the cycle emitting, so forests become net emitters of carbon instead. Um, and, uh, you know, they say, oh, we won't cut trees that are above 30 inches across or eight feet around. But of course, if they want to build a road or if there's a hazard tree or a million other reasons, um, they do find excuses to uh, cut down these large trees. And um, we're talking about Strawberry Valley, which is the rainforest in Plumas County, and you know trees that have more more uh, precipitation grow faster. So they want to get. They've been wanting to get their their uh, chainsaws on these uh, forests for many many years. And um, when the Dixie Fire and the Camp Fire happened in California, I mean I'm assuming they're just kind of like licking their lips and rubbing their hands together and going, okay, now's our chance to really um, take out these forests that we, we've been wanting to when that in fact is, you know, when you look at paradise where 85 people died, many of them uh, died because they didn't have advance notice to evacuate. And that fire approached paradise uh, across a hillside, up a hillside that the U S forest service had treated for community protection several years ago. And they told residents, oh, well, we're doing this for your protection. It'll protect you. And, uh, you know, perhaps some residents failed to do certain defensible space or home hardening because they thought, oh, the U.S. Forest Service has got my back. They're going to stop any fires that might come through. But they didn't. And because people didn't have landlines, some people didn't have landlines and they relied on their cell phones, but the cell tower burned in advance of the um, the evacuation, that, that that lack of notification is why people died. And the availability of a landline to many people is why they sur just barely survived. So that's another issue. Um, you know, we're, we're fighting in California. Uh, people can go to savelandlines.org um, to learn a bit more about that issue. But AT&T is threatening landlines, which is really a, a big threat to our area and to other rural areas in the state that, um, that need to have, you know, reliable communications in the events of a wildfire. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, but uh, erosion. Do you have anything? Oh, to say? Erosion. Yeah, uh, you, you know, I mean, uh, plant matter, uh, uh, forest litter, um, uh, mulch, all of that. Uh, when it when a when a, a, a raindrop comes from the sky, um, those things will dissipate the energy of the raindrop and will allow it to percolate into the soil. When you have uh, soil that is compacted, that is laid bare. You know, you have erosion, um, and that is a, that is a very frequent occurrence of of logging. Um, you know, you see, you drive to to Quincy or take the bus to Quincy. You look up at the the, the hillsides, and they are badly eroded. They've been um, heavily logged after the the, the Claremont fire. Uh, they were heavily sprayed with herbicide, so you don't have those uh, plants and shrubs coming back to hold the soil in place. And they're just a mess up there. I mean, it's just an ecological mess. Um, and, and this is, you know, a small part right now of Plumas County, but uh, it could, it, it's threatening to spread uh, to a much wider area. And I don't think people are quite prepared for the reality of this kind of industrial, massive industrial um, uh, project. I was wondering if there's been input on the proposed plan by any significant part of the Maidu or, and, or Maidu, I'm sorry, I'm not sure the pronunciation, or other Native peoples who, whose ancestors have lived on these lands forever. Or like if there are any of their practices that have been proposed to deal with the very real dangers of these um, forest fires. So I should say, first of all, that state and federal agencies that want to embark on a major project like this are required to consult with uh, the local Native American tribes. Um, that consultation it, it often comes in the form of um, a letter. Um, often these tribes receive dozens to hundreds of letters. Um, so it's it's not possible for them to respond meaningfully to each one. But I know that on this particular project, the 
so-called community protection project. It's my understanding that no local tribes actually did weigh in on this. Um, but in general, I mean, I do know uh, 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 some Native Americans uh, who live locally in the area who are very opposed to this. Some tribes get uh, income from uh, timber harvest and other issues. So that 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 is uh, a factor in all of this. But you know, I think it's safe to say that the uh, industrial equipment and the herbicides are are something that are not consistent with um, traditional native you know land management. Certainly, uh, some some uh, fires you know intentional intentionally burning fires are, have been carried out by Native Americans to improve um, hunting grounds and to improve the ecology. And, you know, that's something that, that we support, you know, um, that when it's uh, done in consultation with Native tribes and it's done with sensitivity to the, the growth cycle of plants, that intentional underburning um, can reduce fuels directly around communities and help defend homes, which is the, really needs to be the primary, primary reason. We can't just build flammable homes in wildfire area and think that those will survive. It's just, you know, we need to... We need to really change our policy on that. So we're, we're going really the wrong way with these forest projects. Yeah, with the home hardening idea um, that you were referencing and defensibility, uh, especially, I don't know if like how much, if, if you've got a bunch of people moving into the area who are renting from people that own the property, how much investment there is from people, working class or, or tech bros or whatever they happen to be, right to actually improve the property and make it safer or from the landlords to do such a thing. But you you mentioned like clearing a hundred feet around a structure. There are some other things that are listed on the, the yeah. Feather River Action website as, and these aren't necessarily your proposals. These are like widely understood and even I think government promote, promoted proposals yeah. for like yeah. hardening houses and community spaces. Can you talk a little bit about what some of those are? Yeah. So, um, I was, you know, 10 years ago, I was fairly ignorant about this stuff, but um, I bought my first home uh, six years ago and it's, it was definitely not fire safe, even though it was in the, the WUI, the wildland urban interface. And I did a lot of research into what, what factors uh, were most important in the survivability of structures because, you know, we're putting our money into this house and uh, um, insurance is very expensive. A lot of people can't afford uh, insurance to cover the whole cost of their house. So they have to get like, you know, insurance to cover half the cost of their house, rebuild a lot smaller or something. And so um, I did a lot of research into this area. And what I found was that um, embers, burning embers, uh, are the single largest cause of home home burnings during a wildfire. And embers can fly up to two to three miles or more when there's heavy winds uh, in front of a fire, and they can start new spot fires. And so what's particularly important and you'll, you saw this in the Maui fires. You know, a lot of the a lot of Maui that community burned, but some of the houses that survived were newly constructed homes that stopped embers from getting in. So embers, uh, you know, you want to basically make sure that all screens are fire hardened. We have screens that um, that actually seal up when the, the temperature gets too high. Um, uh, you know, making sure that any kind of opening, um, any any kind of opening that's like an eighth of an inch or more that will allow embers to squeeze in and maybe light some um, pine needles on fire. Like those are the kinds of things like you want to think like a fire, like how, you know, if you, <laughs> you hold a, a lighter to like around your house, is it going to burn? You know, basically you're going to imagine a bunch of like lit matches landing on and around your house and like, how are you going to stop this, this, this house from burning? And so, Fire resistant uh, siding, um, cement siding, which you know, ironically, and 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 you know, not not everything's easy. Uh, cement siding is, has a huge carbon footprint too, so there aren't really a bunch of like really easy solutions. But as far as like you know, uh, saving your home, you know, fire resistant siding, um, plugging up those vents, clearing like the the first five feet is crit critical around a house. So clearing any like dead vegetation, and you know, when we say defensible space, we don't mean like you know, go and murder every living thing within hundred feet of your house, but you just want to make sure that. The, that the fire isn't carried from the forests 
onto your property and onto your house. Like you want to have defensible space where a fire, you know, a, a firefighter can, or you can, can go and you can, you know, put out the flames. So that's really key is that the embers account for, I believe about 85% of home ignitions, um, direct radiative heat from the forest um, accounts for some of the rest. And um, you just, you just basically that, that is what is critical. That is the piece that is really critical in terms of protecting human communities. Because if we get to a point where human communities are properly defended against fire, fire can just become what it always has been, which is another kind of weather event, which ecology and, and, and environment really depends on in order to reduce some of these fuels. Because right now, you know, we've been uh, engaged in fire suppression and, and heavy industrial logging, especially of old growth areas. And those two things have led to where we are now, you know, the logging is not uh, this fuel removal wonder solution to the problem. Um, it, it actually adds to the, the carbon burden in the atmosphere, it leaves a bunch of flammable material around, um, and it allows wildfires to uh, travel more quickly through dried out and desiccated uh, uh, windy environments, you know, that, that threaten, threaten people's lives. Yeah. Yeah, I had family that was living in uh, Santa Rosa when the Tubbs fire came through and in the coffee, I think coffee neighborhood in the north of town, it was embers that were like going across the high, like eight lanes of 101 and like just blowing through the air for miles, landing on people's roofs yeah, and just yeah. like sparking it, spreading it throughout the neighborhood and people had no idea how to deal with it. So like, yeah, I remember, I remember that I thought that the 101 would stop the flames and the embers just blew right over. Everyone else yeah. did too. Yeah. yeah. Scam. Yeah. So, so you know, you have these initiatives to build these barriers to basically bulldoze hundred foot, two hundred foot wide corridor to block the flames, and the embers just blow right over. You know, so a lot of the destruction that we see in Plumas County from the Dixie Fire actually took place from um, actually was was a, 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 a source. The source of that was uh, you know the firefighters coming in bulldozing. Uh, they bulldozed a big line across uh, the Bucks Lake Wilderness. So whether it's a wilderness it doesn't matter. You know they will go in and 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 that that sh- it sh- you know in the end, uh, Chris uh, Carlton, who's the forest oh. supervisor for the Plumas National Forest, made that call during the Dixie Fire to to bulldoze. Um, uh, you know the, the wilderness area, and in fact, it wasn't necessary to protect the town of Quincy. But but the fact that we're leaving our communities vulnerable to wildfire means that there is going to be almost an inevitable push to damage the forest and to re-engineer the forest to try and you know make it safer for fire personnel to go in. But the 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 the, the factors that the U.S. Forest Service modeled during during their analysis, I mean, they modeled flame lengths. So they say, oh, well, the flame lengths are going to go from 80 feet down to 20 feet. Um, but they didn't mention, they didn't analyze how their actions would modify fuel moisture in the forest um, or wind speeds. And those two factors are really critical in terms of wildfire safety. So it's, it's not a balanced... Um, analysis. They, the U.S. Forest Service decides to analyze things that they think will back up their case that logging um, helps protect communities, and they ignore all the other evidence. Um, and you know that's that's pretty typical. But but there is a huge amount of science coming forward um, that the the U.S. Forest Service approach is wrong. That the 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 priority needs to be from the communities outward rather than from the forest inward. And I I believe that their environmental assessment is faulty. That a judge will hopefully agree with our groups. We filed this lawsuit three weeks ago in federal court. Um, we're demanding an environmental impact statement, a uh, complete, a more complete uh, assessment, um, which w- would buy us time to basically reach out to the community, inform them of the facts, and um, you know, uh, build resistance, uh, popular resistance against this uh, this project. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about some of the companies that are involved in this. So Drax is one that you had you had mentioned when we were emailing back and forth. But uh, yeah, if we could talk about biomass pellets and the sort of capitalist greenwashing of shifting carbon production from one part of the world to another, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, in the UK, uh, I, I was a resident in the UK for um, 
for four or five years when I, I did my master's degree um, several years ago. And uh, I took part in a series of uh, camp, camps for climate action. And um, one of those camps, um, actually before I got to, to the UK, was outside uh, the Drax coal-fired power station in Yorkshire. This is the largest uh, coal-fired, or at the time it was the largest coal-fired station in the UK, and I think responsible for 5 or 6% of the UK's total electricity consumption. And um, because of, of climate commitments uh, and, and so forth, the UK and many other countries have decided to call biomass a, a renewable fuel. So the propaganda that Drax, which is uh, which owns this plant, puts out there is that they harvest the, the fuels. A lot of the time, it's just you know sticks and and brush and things that are left over from the timber industry. They'll compress them into pellets and they'll burn them, and uh, that doesn't you know burn any fossil fuels. And it actually, I mean, if they do carbon capture and sequestration, they actually can capture that that uh that carbon so it sounds good but the reality is that uh, biomass energy puts out two to three times the amount of uh, carbon per energy unit um, than coal which is considered the dirtiest fuel so what you're doing is basically what drax was found to, to be doing is going into british columbia forests uh cutting down trees that were a rare species and this like old growth, very valuable habitat and using whole trees to basically create pellets to power uh, U- the UK's um, you know, biggest, biggest uh, power plant. And so um, the assumption is, is that when you harvest the forest, they grow back and that they will absorb that carbon out of the atmosphere. But there's no follow up. There's no regulations by governments. Um, you know, the, 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 the forest uh, management side and the biomass burning side are two sides of the same coin. So um, what we're talking about uh, right now in California, uh, Drax, uh, which is a multinational corporation, uh, signed a memorandum of, of understanding with Golden State Natural Resources, a pseudo-governmental agency, to build uh, two large pellet factories, one in Tuolumne County and one in Lassen County, um, and an export facility in Stockton. These are some of some of the uh, you know, lowest income areas in the in the state, um, already suffering from environmental racism and burdens, um, and basically these two biomass plants would essentially consume forests for a hundred mile radius around each each uh, plant. So the one in Lassen is of particular concern to us um, and we're very opposed to that because Plumas County's forests lie within that hundred mile radius and these are home to like really, really uh, endangered and, and um, beleaguered wildlife um, and, and habitat. So when someone says, oh, fuel reduction, you know, think, think, um, when they say fuel, think habitat, because that's what we're talking about here. You know, when when the machines come through, they don't like stop and allow the animals to evacuate. They just plow through. So it's a pretty brutal um, activity, no matter how you how you slice it. Um, in terms of who, which companies are using the logs from this project, Sierra Pacific is uh, the major uh, lo- logging company. They have a mill here in Quincy. We know that they are planning to use uh, and sell a lot of the materials. And also a company called Sierra Tahoe Environmental Management, LLC, was formed in response to the U.S. Forest Service bid solicitation. uh, And they won a contract in December for $86 million um, of of the logging. So there's a lot of these these opportunistic new corporations that are are springing up. And, uh, you know, you have basically contractors who have contractors who have contractors who hire contractors to go out in the forest. And there's very little oversight site from the actual forest service itself. Um, And uh, because it's such a large project, you know, you don't have perhaps the thoroughness uh, of the biological studies that you would in, in smaller projects. And so, for example, you know, we said to the forest service after reading their report, well, you know, which expert said that this, your project won't have a significant impact on wolves or on the spotted owl? or on red-legged or yellow-legged frogs. And they could not give me an answer. They, they just did not answer me. Um, so the, 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 the reality is, if you look at this study, it's 800 pages. It looks impressive, you know. But I, I actually sat down and read it, 
And it really doesn't add up. I mean, there's no there's no one listed who's who's a qualified expert who can actually make this determination. A lot of it seems to just be copied and pasted um, from off the shelf, and like they're just trying to push this forward. You know, um, when there can be you know there's very likely to be very real risks to highly endangered and threatened species. Well, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the upcoming Lost Sierra Action Camp, what you know about it, where where it's going to be, what will be discussed, and how people can get involved with it. So Sierra Nevada forests are facing their worst threat ever, potentially, through these, these community community destruction projects um, and land management. They want to, uh, they're encouraging an all lands approach to this. So they're working with, you know, private uh, landowners and other landowners to um, do these same kind of treatments um, that increase wildfire danger and harm ecology. And there's another pathway that we have available to us, uh, which is, you know, in our view, more sensible. And that is to take all of the Sierra forests, the entire Sierra Nevada mountain range, and to rewild it and protect it as a vital atmospheric carbon storage and sponge. And when we talk about carbon sequestration, a lot of the time it's about you know competitions to figure out the technology, how we're going to capture store, uh, carbon and store it, you know, deep underground or something like that. But but forests are already doing this, and forests have the capacity to absorb a lot of carbon if we'll just allow them to grow and to rewild naturally. Um, there's a study that uh, that that said that basically 84 million tons of carbon would be sequestered a year if all federal lands were protected. Um, so that's a huge amount of carbon that because we not only need to you know stop burning fossil fuels and stop eating as much meat and change our transportation and our utility systems, but we all we, we have a bunch of carbon up there that is not safe <laughs> going forward. We need to draw that down, and so forests are really the low hanging fruit, the easy way to do that. And in areas that have been rewilded in in Europe, um, we see local economies. Um, improve, you know, um, economic opportunities for local people to act as guides um, and a real interest and um, inspiration from the general population to go to these places to see an, an intact ecosystem. So that's what we're pushing for, what we continue to push for. We hold that vision. And we are particularly excited about a group called La Sierra Forest Defense, which is going to be holding a an action camp here in Plumas County from May 23rd to 29th over Memorial Day weekend. Um, this is for folks from um, all over the country to come and to experience the La Sierra and these ancient forests. And, you know, our hope is that uh, the public outrage and pressure will force an end to these unlawful forest uh, demolition plans, essentially. Um, but um, we've been invited to do a workshop at the, the camp. And um, we're really excited about people coming in from outside the area, people from within the area who are alarmed about the loss of their natural forests, um, coming together and um, having fun experiencing the, the wild uh, areas that are at risk um, and taking action to, um, to protect them. Cool. And people can find out more about that um, by going to lostsierraforest.wordpress.com lostsierraforest.wordpress.com and general updates about the resistance to the community destruction project can be found on our website at featherriveraction.org. We've we've seen increasing resistance, particularly in the West this year against these outrageous um, old growth and mature logging plans. And particularly in um, in Oregon, uh, there's the the poor windy sale that uh, Bureau of Land Management is trying to push through, and uh, some brave souls from up there are are, are currently occupying the, one of the old growth trees that they want to cut down to access this area. And so, um, you know, we're we we stand in solidarity with with these folks and any other folks um, around Western forests who are who are working to protect them, who are working to to be the last line of defense for for these um, sensitive ecosystems. Um, and, you know, uh, we're hoping that this summer will be a, a summer of action. You know, um, what, what, what the, the Forest Service is doing is threatening to reignite the timber wars of the 1990s. Um, and uh, because of the, just the scale and the uh, aggressiveness of their plans and the public needs to come together. We hope to see you soon um, here in, in Plumas County. We need folks here on the ground um, going out into the forest. Uh, if you want to come, contact us through through forest, uh, featherriveraction.org 
we'll find a place for you. Um, but we, we, we do need people to come here and uh, be on the ground defense for the forest and, uh, and its inhabitants. I think that something like this can only be pushed through with an undercurrent of human supremacy, really, because it says that you know, human needs are more important, that we can just bulldoze the, the homes and the lives of forest dwellers without re repercussions. And I think that's not consistent with what we know to be true about ecology, and it's not true or consistent with what we know about climate science. And so, um, uh, you know, the fact that this, these folks, uh, La Sierra Forest Defense, are holding a climate forest action camp to link these two um, issues together, I think is really timely. And it's something that people who are desperate and upset about climate change can really do. It's achievable, um, that's urgent, that's immediate and effective. Yeah. And again, especially for any listeners that are in like that are down river, this is like besides the climate impacts and all of the ways that that comes to affect us, our loved ones and strangers. It's very real also with just the water that you're drinking or the um, the vegetables. I mean, California is a breadbasket for North America, whether we like it or not. So in some ways, good. In some ways, <coughs> almonds, uh, not so good. <laughs> but like, yeah, this this is literally life. And like, if, if water is life, then this is like also life or death. Yes. But cool. Well, I think that's, that's all the questions that I had for you, Josh. Do you have any other, any parting thoughts or anything that you want to share? I just wanted to add, you know, there's a series of threats against our area, the Feather River watershed. A lot of these threats revolve around false climate solutions. So this idea, you know, one with the logging that we can log heavily and that will reduce fire risk rather than just the opposite. Uh, and also uh, this idea that we can continue our hypermobile society, but just switching from gasoline to electric. And um, I was up in um, Thacker Pass in northern Nevada, the Pahimaha um, native lands of the Shoshone and the Paiute peoples. And um, uh, this is a, a lithium mine that Donald Trump um, authorized when he was president um, and is going forward. But it's it's heartbreaking um, that the, these these ancient lands, rich ecological lands, are just being bulldozed. Um, this is not green at all. It's a complete green wash. And another, uh, you know, linked to that Thacker Pass lithium mine, um, and another uh, element that is really needed to create lithium batteries for electric cars is copper. And uh, Plumas County has one of the largest deposits of copper. And so a company called U.S. Copper Corporation is trying to come in. They want to access 1.3 billion pounds of copper um, to, to meet the demand for lithium car batteries uh, because the price of copper has gone up with demand. And they want to um, build a, basically a massive uh, open pit mine. Uh, and, uh, you know, that has sulfuric acid drainage into the Feather River watershed. Um, they're trying to use vested rights um, to say that they already have rights to, to, to mine. They don't have to go through environmental review. Um, and a group called the Feather River Watershed Alliance is um, taking the lead on, on opposing that. They've got attorneys. They're organizing. Um, people need to speak out by May 8th to comment to Plumas County on that one. And if people want to learn more about that, that copper mine that threatens the whole region, um, there's more details at FeatherRiverWatershedAlliance.org. FeatherRiverWatershedAlliance.org. Cool. Thank you for remembering to, to bring up the mine because I, I totally like off, off yeah. my head. Yeah. Um, well, thanks a lot for having the conversation and good luck. I hope that this helps to raise awareness and get more people involved. Yeah, really appreciate your, your coverage and your solidarity. And um, yeah, thanks so much for, for having us on today. Absolutely. If you want to support The Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay. Or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf support. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. I'm going to make those pompous academics regret kicking out such a genius. Deciding to build my lab and do my research. The Time Talks Podcast. Have you ever stared at a 500-page book and wish you could just talk to the author about their ideas instead? If so, the Time Talks Podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network, is for you. 
where we discuss history, politics, music, and art with an anti-authoritarian and anarchist perspective. The Time Talks Podcast. What's this light? I feel different. The Time Talks Podcast. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. A female amateur swimmer has filed a civil lawsuit to challenge the inclusion of transgender athletes in female competitions. This arises from a situation where the female swimmer placed behind an athlete who had been born male but had transitioned to female. The suing swimmer has expressed that she feels she was robbed of a medal because the transgender athlete had biological advantages from being born male. Now the question of whether transgender athletes have a biological advantage is going to be settled in the U.S. court system, which is where we always want important questions settled because the courts have a long history of being so phantasmerific. But in the meantime, this lawsuit has contributed to the culture war controversy. Far-right wackadoodles like Ron DeSantis in Florida have been railing against transgenderism, whatever in the hell that is. And we now suffer through political ads put out by Republicans who promise to keep boys out of girls' sports and girls' bathrooms. There's an implicit argument that if transgender students are treated with dignity and respect, this will lead to pubescent boys perving out in the girls' locker room or will increase the instance of rape in America as if rapists have only been restrained by symbols on bathroom doors. Rapists have had their own spaces for centuries. They're called fraternity houses. I've heard wackadoodles oppose a program where drag queens read books to elementary school students because the drag queens will try to turn our kids gay. (laughs) Yeah, that's all it takes, you know. Someone with the stage name of Sparkles reading a boy at the little train that could, and he'll want to chop off his genitals and sing show tunes. People are so stupid. So I want to be cautious in this heightened environment of ignorance and insensitivity, as I don't want to provide fuel to haters and snivelers fighting to deny space to LBGTQ plus people. But I think we do have to approach the question of sports and whether or not someone born male has any biological advantages when competing against females after transitioning. I think that's a legitimate question to explore. Now, I've heard arguments related to muscles and hormones, that males have more testosterone and develop a greater ratio of muscle to body weight than females. But transgender advocates respond, once someone transitions, The hormone treatments reduce that muscle mass and therefore take away that advantage. And this sounds right to me. Personally, I don't think there is a muscle advantage for someone born male and transitioned to female. But I also watch sports. I know that in NBA basketball, most of the male athletes can dunk the basketball. Even going back a few decades, a player well under six feet tall named Spud Webb could dunk. But in the WNBA, few female players can dunk. That's just a reality. And it isn't a question of height. Some of the female players are over 6'6 and can't dunk, while male athletes much shorter can. And I have to think it's not a muscle thing. NBA players don't have massive muscular legs. So it made me wonder if maybe there's a difference in skeletal development to account for this dunk disparity. Now, I'm no biologist. I'm just an idiot pondering a question. But I do have a hypothesis. If you look at a male skeleton standing with his feet together, you'll notice his thigh bones are generally straight up and down, vertical, parallel. That's how they fit into the hip sockets. But a female skeleton doesn't look the same, generally. Generally, the hips are wider, and so the tops of the thigh bones are slightly separated, the thigh bones slightly angled. Those bones make a kind of elongated V-shape from the hip bone to the knee. 
Now, why does this matter? Well, because when a male propels himself upward toward the basket to dunk, all of that energy is directed upward. For a female athlete, some of that energy is wasted, pushing outward rather than upward. Hence, men dunk while most women don't. It's just a theory. But what I'm suggesting is the possibility that how the thigh bone connects to the hip bone might make a subtle difference in post-pubescent males and females, impacting a very specific athletic skill set. Another subtle difference is the clavicle. In males, the clavicle is generally straight, while in females, the clavicle is generally curved. This contributes to the wider shoulders of a post-pubescent male compared to a female. So the question arises, does this subtle skeletal difference impart an advantage to an athlete-born male? Could it be that the straighter clavicle gives a transgender swimmer some kind of advantage in cutting through the water? I don't know. But I think those are questions we need to answer, whatever the answer turns out to be. I think the larger issue we're not addressing, though, is the fact that all sports seem to be defined by the skill sets and physicalities we normally associate with maleness. Things like brute force, power, aggression. But I remember in grade school we did an experiment, standing bent over with our heads against the wall, trying to pick up a chair and then stand up. The girls could do it, the boys couldn't. Our centers of gravity were too high. So just as an example, if that were a sport, the girls would compete for medals and the boys would feel like useless losers. I'm just saying, in the bigger picture, sport in our culture is tailored to maleness, shaped by maleness, fashioned for male competition. I think the emphasis on women's sports is long overdue. But so far, it seems that women are merely entering into those sports already defined by maleness rather than formulating new sport defined by femaleness and the advantage or perceived advantage derived from female biology. The only example I can think of of sport designed by women for women is roller derby. In a truly inclusive culture in the future, there will be dozens of sports like roller derby, tailored, shaped, and fashioned for female competition. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. This is the Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. Programming support is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm is a bookstore and social movement space owned by its workers in operation since 2008. Their event calendar and complete catalog of books can be found online at firestorm.coop.